Hey, Peter. Hey, Tony. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right trying to get through this cold winter over here, but I know, well, yeah. I was going to say, I know you're not in the same situation, but Greece gets cold, right? Yeah, Greece has been freezing, actually, the last couple of weeks. I mean, Did you guys get I more snow? Wouldn't leave the house without wouldn't leave the house without a parka and gloves and a hat and the whole nine yards. So, but today it's today, yesterday, the weekend, it's been heaven. I mean, just absolutely beautiful. And, yeah, usually, uh, I think out, this, really... usually by mid February, things start to finally turn around in Greece, right? Yeah. Although last year on this date, we had uh, 10 inches of snow downtown Athens. Mm. So yeah, I guess you never know. Cautiously optimistic that we're, I, to tell you the truth, I was glad we had a little bit of winter here and we had a big snowstorm. That was great. The only thing that wasn't great about it was how many trees fell in downtown Athens. Because the really? snow was, yeah, the snow was so wet. I mean, the National Gardens where I walk my dog every morning have been closed. Well, they were closed for almost two weeks um, because there was so much damage from trees falling. Uh -huh. So uh, that was looked nice, but it was sort yeah. of after the niceness of how it looked wore off it was you were like oh my god look at the destruction and the internet shuts down because all of the grease social media becomes all snow pictures and snow videos usually when it snows right <laughs> i know i know it's funny people i mean people were skiing down metropolis where i live <laughs> yeah. That was funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah anyways i'm uh, excited to get this uh chat going um before we get started want to introduce yourself to my audience sure uh my name is peter poulos in greek my name is panayotis ioannis Pulimanakos. But uh, uh, in America, it's Peter John Poulos. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Hellenic Initiative. I've been the executive director for three and a half years, but I've been with the organization for nine and a half years um, in various, I was the development director and development consultant. So sort of held a lot of jobs there and done a lot of things there. Uh, and, uh, and before that, uh, you know, I had my own business, Poulos Brothers, a fundraising and event planning business that was based in San Francisco, where I worked for, you know, 100 different nonprofits around the country doing major donor work and board development and capital campaigns and special events and all those kinds of things. So, um, and, uh, and that's in San Francisco where I lived for, I mean, I didn't grow up there, but I lived there for 18 years. I'm the founding director of the San Francisco Greek Film Festival. Um, and that's something I'm really proud of because now the festival is in like its 16th or 17th year. Um, and uh, that was taken over by two other people around the committee. And before that, I lived in Washington, D.C., worked on Capitol Hill, worked at the Greek lobby um, and um, uh, went to school in D.C. Before that, I grew up in New York. Um, so I've been basically surrounded by Greeks my entire life. Everywhere. <clears throat> Everywhere. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I want to touch, obviously, on THI. Um, as you said, you're the executive director. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the growth of THI since you've taken over and prior from the, the days you got involved for, to where it is today. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've been with THI since day one. It was George Stamus, our board president, you know, who brought me into the organization. And, and I was just, immediately, I was just sort of impressed with how it was organized, the fact that Greeks around the world were sort of getting together, you know, that they, that they were actually not just getting organized, but they were actually writing big checks, you know, to support Greece, and that their mission was super clear that the organization was to engage Greeks in the diaspora, basically fundraise from Greeks in the diaspora in order and, and all of the money to come to Greece to do two things, support um, uh, charitable organizations that were working to relieve pain and suffering at the time as a result of the financial crisis. So to feed people, close people, house people, pay people's medical bills, et cetera, and to support entrepreneurs and economic development work. And that really spoke to me. I thought, okay, this is interesting. And that had, in, in my work in the non-Greek world, you know, fundraising for, you know, 30 years, and I fundraised on Capitol Hill, I fundraised in San Francisco for all these nonprofits that had nothing to do with Greece or Greek people. You know, I was focused on those issues. And so that, um, like, spoke to me. I thought, okay, this is, this is an organization I could really get behind. Um, so, you know, and George Stamus and Andrew Laveras, our board chairman, and uh, Dean DeColius, you know, and the founders of our board, Mutar Kent, you know, and George David, they did an amazing job, George, George and Andrew in particular, you know, of attracting other sort of um, <clears throat> other extremely um, accomplished Greeks in the diaspora from all over, not just from the United States, but from Canada, from Australia, from France, from the UK, 
um, mostly the English speaking world. Uh, and, and the organization just sort of grew. I mean, right off the bat, you know, we started giving out millions of dollars. In the, in the nine and a half years that I've been involved in direct aid, we've given out about 18 and a half million, uh, but in indirect aid, it's much more. Um, and, um, and in the last, you know, we started with an executive director, a guy named Miles Pressler, who did an amazing job. Um, and he was a McKinsey guy. And then Mark Arry, who you know, Father Mark Arry, a uh, former Greek Orthodox priest, he took over and he really had a great vision for the organization and moved the ball forward with THI. And um, we had really good growth, like under Mark Arry's <clears throat> leadership. And then when I took over from Mark Arry three and a half years ago, I really wanted to run THI like a business. Um, and because I you know, had run my own business for years. And so, <clears throat> you know, we sort of changed the way we ran the organization financially, you know, reporting wise, uh, and um, we we staffed up a bit. And the last three and a half years, we've had kind of explosive growth, especially on social media. Um, and even just last year, you know, our numbers went through the roof, you know, 140% increase on Instagram, 170% increase, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, like a 20% increase on Facebook. And that's important for us as an organization because it drives contributions. Like when we started 10 years ago, um, you know, I would say probably less than half of our contributions came from online. And now it's more like 90% of our contributions come online. So, you know, we, we sort of needed to, um, to understand that and to see it and to plan for it. And we did. Um, and so now, you know, like when we, you, you know this because you contributed to it and you helped with it. When we ran our wildfire campaign last year, the relief fund campaign, you know, we were hoping to raise 50,000 and we, we ended up raising 720,000. I mean, a Amazing. huge amount of money. I mean, I don't, you know, from 4,200 different donors from 47 countries around the world, I don't think we would, I mean, none of us could have ever expected something like that. So um, that is, um, uh, and we just keep growing. I, I just, we keep hearing from Greeks all now, you know, we're hearing from a lot of Greeks in South Africa, we're hearing from a lot of Greeks who live in Switzerland, like in Geneva and Gestad, you know, we're, we're just, we're hearing, we're getting contributions and hearing from lots of Greeks in German cities like Stuttgart, you know, and, um, uh, and uh, Monaco, you know, and other places where we know, you know, they're like big, you know, Greek diaspora communities. I just did my first webcast with the Greek community in Buenos Aires. Um, that was like, that was fascinating. Um, so uh, yeah, it's um, the organization's growing. I kind of feel like, you know, if we think that there's as many Greeks living outside of Greece as there are in Greece, then, you know, you think the, you know, the, the possibilities for growth with an organization like ours are almost endless. Right. So THI is obviously donation driven. Um, talk to me about the ways that donations are, do come in and has so what, I, I know the social media has helped, but to what extent um, has that helped donations over the years? Yeah, so I mean, we like I was saying, you know, we used to get a lot of our donations came in through snail mail, you know, like people mm -hmm. would write a check and send it in and we would send out like, you know, I'll give you an example. We'd send out like an end of the year appeal, you know, to like the 30,000 names in our database, uh, like around the world. And we'd wait for the checks to come in. Now we don't even, I think we only mail out a hundred letters now, you know, to right. like snail mail letters, everything else is done online, you know, and our end of the year appeal raises 10 times more money than it used to raise, you know, when we just did snail mail. So, and I, you know, social media has had a lot to do with that. And, um, and to that end, you know, we hired somebody like a full-time person who just works on our social media for us. Um, and we also hired somebody who handles search engine, engine optimization for us as well, because, you know, we applied to Google grants as an organization and we were, um, we are gifted now $10,000 a month in free advertising from Google grants. And we can actually use that, um, you know, to do search engine optimization. And so we've sort of put that to use and we're running campaigns with it. Um, and that's just making a big difference in our engagement, because as you know, you can grow your online community, you know, 
Um, you can buy numbers, you know, you can buy followers, you can do all that stuff, but we wanted to grow our online community organically because right. if you grow it organically, you're going to have loyalty. And if you have loyalty, you're going to bring in contributions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and if you get somebody to contribute once, you can most likely, as long as you create good content, you can get them to, you know, to give again and again and again and again, you know? And so, and, you know, we like to tell as an organization, you know, it's interesting for us to learn, you know, from like, you know, from digital marketing firms, you know, that we worked with that, you know, like stop telling, stop patting THI on the back, they were saying, like, stop telling the THI story, you know, like, just start telling the story, you know, of the people who are doing good works for THI, tell your story that way, you know, and so, you know, we sort of changed the way we packaged, you know, um, our storytelling. And as you know, it just made a huge difference, you know, in the response we were getting and the engagement we were getting from people. Um, and that, um, you know, and Xeni Covelli, who handles our social media, you know, and Artemis Kohas, who does a lot with our marketing and Maria Papastathi in our New York office, you know, and our whole team, Michael Princos and Tina Corpus, like, you know, everyone's got a piece of it, you know, that, you know, that's contributing to it. You know, Michael does the programmatic piece, T Tina does the corporate piece, Artemis does an amazing job with the community, you know, like development piece, you know, Maria's development piece of it. Um, Xeni does the social media piece and sort of bring all of that together, you know, and, you know, the effects of it are like synergistic, you know, like we, you know, we run these campaigns, these sort of thoughtful campaigns that just sort of bring in, you know, a lot of money. And I think also because we've been so upfront and honest with people, we'll say, you know, like for the wildfires, for instance, you know, we say to people like every single penny of the money that's raised going directly to help people who are affected by the wildfires. And that's true. All that money sits in a restricted account, you know, and it's going to go directly to people affected by the wildfires. You know, none of it goes to administrative expenses. None of it goes to anything. And that's because our board, who is incredibly generous, they cover all of THI's administrative expenses throughout the year. And so that allows us, you know, when we raise funds like that, a wildfire campaign, that allows us to give all the funds to the people that it's intended for. I think that that was an important moment, I think, for a Greek diaspora organization as well, you know, because so many Greeks in the diaspora, you know, were sort of hesitant or reticent to give money to anything happen in Greece because they'd sort of been burned before. I, my friend Pavlos Yeralanos, who used to be, um, you know, the uh, Minister of Culture here in Greece um, for years, you know, he said, like, Greece's relationship with the diaspora is like a moth's relationship with a light bulb, you know, like, it looks good and you want to get close to it, but every time you do, you get burned. You know, and I yeah. like it made me laugh. I've always thought about that, you know, because that is sort of the relationship, you know, that the diaspora has had, you know, like with the home cut, with the patrida, like with the mothership. But that's changing, you know. And so on a parallel track with fundraising, we need to sort of build trust in Greece as an institution and its institutions, you know. And um, and, you know, we needed to like report back to people that we were, you know, doing the right thing with their money. And so and that's what we do. And now that we have a government, you know, who's pro-business, you know, who's making huge changes in the way the country operates, you know, who's attracting foreign investment, like, you know, and creating jobs in the country. You know, it's just, it, 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 it seems so vibrant, you know, and like, um, and like the, the, you know, we call it Greece 2.0. The country has definitely turned a corner. I'm sure you see that too. Yeah, uh, I see it every day, uh, especially online. You see all these new uh, great articles coming out out of, out of Greece. Yeah. And I think uh, that, you know, that encourages people like to get back to your original question that encourages people to want to give to the country, because if, mm -hmm. you know, if you gave before and then you read it, you know, in the paper or saw in the news, you know, that, oh, you know, like the monies that were meant for villages that were burned in the fires in 2007 never made it to those villages. You're like, well, I'm not going to give money again. It's just going to get it's going to exactly. get stolen. But now, you know, when we can report back to people, we bought six fire trucks, you know, we planted 50,000 trees, you know, this is what we did with your money. You know, we helped 100 bee farmers, you know, like reconstitute their bee farms, which we did. Um, you know, like when you can tell people that, you know, they're like, OK, I'll give again, you know, um, right. it's powerful. Um, yeah, now, I wanted to touch a little bit on the wildfires. I know you just spoke on it, but just the success of it. And what inspired to just jump on that pretty much immediately? Well, you know, when they first, when the fires first broke out, you know, we said, you know, they were just in Athens. They seemed to be isolated here in Athens. 
And we thought, you know, are we going to do something about this? You know, because at the end of the day, we're a crisis relief organization. Um, right. And we said, let's like wait and see. The fires seem to go out, you know. And so we thought, okay, you know, and they were in like wealthy areas of Athens. And we thought like, okay, do we really need to do something about this? And then later that week, you know, when the fires just seemed to like they went out of control, it was that, oh, I, I mean, it was that Wednesday night, I had a conversation with the whole team and we said, we need to get on this like now. And so like very quickly with um, our graphic designer, John Mandala, who you might know does like a terrific job, you know, and Artemis and Xeni and Michael and Maria Tina, the whole team, we put together a fantastic, you know, like, I think very thoughtful campaign, you know, around the wildfires and um, as you did, you know, and we blasted that out into the universe. Um, and then because of like influencers like you and others, like, you know, Earth Focus, there's like 7 million followers shared right. our campaign, you yeah, know, encouraging their, encouraging their members to give to THI's wildfire campaign. You know, we had yeah. a member of the royal family you know, in Denmark, you know, decide that for her 50th birthday party, she wanted all of the gifts to come to THI's wildfire campaign. You know, we, you know, we had like employee groups, like Greek employee groups from all over Europe to decide, you know, to do their own little fundraisers, you know, for, you know, THI's wildfire campaign. On, on Facebook alone, we raised 140,000, over 140,000. I mean, it was shocking where the contributions came in. And, and, you know, when you looked, especially at like, I'm always interested in the Greek names, like, you know, where are they from? Like so many Greeks from Singapore, you know, Singapore, Japan, Uruguay, you know, like Greeks from like all over the planet, you know, who gave to the campaign and they just, and they kept giving and they kept giving. And we, you know, were reporting back to them about, to tell you the truth, we didn't know what we were going to do with the money right away. You know, right. um, we found out, you know, after we'd collected all these funds that basically, you know, the country didn't really, doesn't really have, you know, like a land, any sort of land management program to speak of, you know, mm -hmm. and that, especially in areas that are burned, you know, you want the forest to regenerate on its own, you know, and so um, the, the big problem with burned areas is keeping farmers livestock from off of those air from grazing on those areas because they eat all the new shoots and that keeps the forest from regenerating. So, you know, like that's a bigger challenge, but you, you know, you need to reforest, you know, in areas where, you know, landslides, you know, could happen. You need to reforest in urban forests because urban forests just don't regenerate on their own the same way, you know, a rural forest would like regenerate. So, you know, we learned a lot and we learned a huge amount about bees um, mm -hmm. because, you know, like Greece lost 40% of its overall, like, you know, beehives and bee production, huge. Um, and we learned that, you know, it takes about um, 10 beehives to regenerate a colony uh, and that it takes about a month to get the queen and the swarm like working again. Um, right. and, and then you have to transport, you know, those beehives in the night, you know, like during the evening while the bees are sleeping, you know, and you can, and because they're transportable, you can bring them to areas, you know, where they're able to feed and stuff. And as soon as the new shoots come up, you know, the bees have things to feed off of. But in Evia, you know, obviously that had like the biggest fires, you know, they lost 70% of their bee production, you know, that, that island. And that's right. huge because that, you know, so many of the people on the island dependent upon that, you know, for their livelihoods. So, um, yeah, it was, we learned a lot with that campaign, a lot. And I think the biggest lesson, our, the biggest lesson from that campaign was to, like, to start quickly. Like, if we had waited till the weekend was over to start our campaign, I don't think it would have gone anywhere. Right. The fact that we started it, like, immediately made all the difference. Definitely. Um, aside from things like wildfires that you guys help out, can you Tell me the type of people that THI benefits in Greece. Yeah, listen, we do, a, we, you know, we do a, a tremendous amount of work with kids, you know, and, um, you know, so we work with lots of organizations that are helping at-risk kids. Um, one of the organizations that we've given over half a million dollars to is called Mazio de Pedi, Together for Children. Um, the president of their board is Alexandra Martino, who's like a great friend of like, of THIs. And um, they're an umbrella organization for like, you know, a dozen different 
organizations in Greece that are working to help, you know, at-risk children and mothers, you know, and sing and women who are like, you know, being abused, you know, so we don't like talking about these things in Greece. Um, we do a lot about feeding people. So, you know, we help, you know, Prolepsis Diatrophis, which is feeding kids in schools, the food bank, Athens Food Bank, where they've done, I mean, like an amazing, amazing job, like of feeding. I think they're, they do like 1700 meals a day, you know, um, we help, um, uh, even, and you know, we, we also try to look outside of Athens, you know, because so much of the focus in Greece is always in Athens. So, you know, we help a small organization called the Ladies Union of Drama. Um, and, you know, they're feeding 1500 people a day, you know, individuals. And it's actually, when we say individuals there, it's probably more like families, you know, but they're feeding 1500 individuals a day in drama, in and around drama. It's such a great organization too, because they, they'll just, they feed anyone that needs food. It doesn't matter your, you know, your race, your, your color of your skin, you know, your religion, your sexuality, none of that matters. They just want to feed people who are hungry. It's also nice to see an organization like that in a little place like drama, you know, who that's just, that's just caring about people. You know, it doesn't matter. They care about everybody. It doesn't just have to be Greeks. It can just be anybody in Greece who's in need. Um, so, um, and then of course, you know, we do a tremendous amount of work in the economic development arena. So, you know, we're, we support startups, our venture impact award. We just in December, we gave out 285,000 in grants, you know, to 16 different Greek startups. Um, and, you know, that's funded, that, that funding comes from the Heladoni Foundation, um, uh, which is run by Dimitri, it's, it's Dimitri and, and Sarah Georgiakopoulos' foundation and by um, the Charles C. Kondas Trust, which is managed by Harriet Kondas Dervaikis, um, you know, and uh, she's based in Chicago. Dimitri and his wife are based in Boston, but now they've moved to Greece. And because of those two generous like donors and their donations, we're able to like give out all of this money every year, you know, to these, you know, to these incredible startups. And, you know, the grants range from 10,000 to 30,000, but as you know, for like a Greek company, $30,000, that can like that can pay your rent for three years. That can buy everyone in your office a computer. You know that can buy you you know a three D printer. You know they buy you a car. Buy whatever it is something that you need to scale your business. You know to take it to the next level. Um, and on top of you know just giving them money, you know we also you know we have a mentorship program called Venture Garden that we run with um, Alba Graduate School and uh, Anatolia College in Thessaloniki. Um, you know we have a regeneration program. Um, that is um, Greece's like number one paid internship program. Um, and uh, that has been wildly successful. It's put over 2,500 people in permanent positions, you know, in, um, in the years that, you know, we've been supporting it. So, you know, we're, we do a lot in job creation and we do a lot in supporting like young entrepreneurial Greeks. I mean, it's such a great entrepreneurial spirit here, as you know, you know, it's sort of like we were, it's like, it's like in our DNA, um, and so, but there just doesn't hasn't, there hasn't been like a mechanism or a vehicle, you know, to support people with a great idea. And so, you know, we want to like, we want to sort of, you know, we want to be part of that ecosystem that's supporting these people. That's amazing, man. Um, I want to talk about the gala and I'm assuming this is the event of the year. Well, I'm not assuming this is basically teach as event of the year uh, where everyone gets together, but tell me the importance of the gala as far as donations and just keeping the community together? You know, the gala, you know, we just had our ninth gala, as you know. Um, uh, actually, the gala was George Stamus's idea. Um, so when the organization started, George was like, let's, let's, we need to have a big blowout gala, like in New York, high profile event, you know, where we raise a lot of money. And that was when I was first hired. He said, Peter, can you help with the gala? I said, sure. So, um, so we put together a budget that first year in New York, said, let's try and raise 350,000, which would have been a huge amount of money. You know, um, we didn't raise 350,000. We ended up raising 1.8 million at that first gala. Um, and I, you know, George is like, I think we're onto something. I said, yeah, I think, I think you're onto something. So, um, you know, the gala has become, I feel like the go-to event in the Greek diaspora community globally. Um, I mean, there's other organizations that have amazing events too: the National Hellenic Museum, the National Hellenic Society, the Ohide Foundation, um, you know, the Archons. I mean, the people that have big events that like raise a lot of money 
Father Alex's Blue Dream, you know, out in Southampton, like hugely successful. Um, but our gala has become like the, I think the the lar- the most successful fundraising event in all the global Greek diaspora. This year we raised two point one million. Um, you know, we we had seven hundred and eighty people there. Um, we had you know two hundred people on a waiting list, um, and you know we cut off ticket sales two and a half weeks before. So we would have probably had more like 400 people on a waiting list. Um, And, you know, I think that, you know, I mean, we're social beings, you know, and Greeks are like really social beings. Like we like having a good party, you know, for a good cause. Um, You know, one of the taglines of our new leaders group, our 40 years and younger group is, you know, uh, is uh, networking with a purpose. And I sort of feel like that's what our gala has become. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. become this big, wonderful networking event, but it also feels like, it's family too. Like you're there to celebrate, you know, all these, you know, all these great organizations that we're helping, but you're also sort of there to celebrate each other. You know, it's like sort of the creme de la creme of the Greek community. And it's just sort of growing like year by year, you know, and people like you, you know, who, you know, sort of like had an idea and ran with it, you know, and made like a huge business, you know, like with it, you know, like, I mean, those are the people whose stories, you know, like we want to tell. And those are the people who, you know, we want to be a part of our gala and part of like, you know, THI's community. I think, you know, we sort of struck a nice balance with our event too. Um, and, you know, every year we learn something new. This year, you know, our entire spoken program was 30 minutes. Um, and I think that we learned that next year, our entire spoken program, this year, later this year, our entire spoke or, uh, spoken program should be 20 minutes. Like, right. you know, right. like, let's tell our story, Be you know, by like with one good video, you know, let's have like a good honoree. Let's like, you know, have a great auction and um, and let's have the program be brief because everybody in the room wants to sort of schmooze with one another. They want to have a good time, you know, but they want it. They want to be inspired by the work that THI does, but they don't need to be inspired in a two and a half hour program. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. And I think that's a mistake. That's a mistake a lot of like organizations make, you know, too many honorees, too much spoken programs, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And people are just sort of fidgety and they don't want to sit through it, you know, and it was really the direction of our of our board leadership. I mean, it was Andrew Laveras, you know, and George Stamus, you know, Michael Psaros and others on our board who were like, keep it short and brief, you know. Right. And these are people who are obviously going to like these kinds of events like every night, you know, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Is that something that, you guys got better at each year or from the bat right off the bat, that was the vision, a short speech, let everyone have a good time. I think we've gotten better at it over the years because we definitely had some events, you know, that were like a lot longer than they should have been. You know, Um, I think this year, you know, we, we definitely hit it out of the ballpark this year. That was, it was good. And it was challenging because, you know, we had two venues, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. but, you know, we definitely, we definitely hit it out of the ballpark this year by keeping the program brief, you know, They're meaningful, but brief. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned something about the gala, the silent auction. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. How is that ran? How does somebody submit an item each year? How does that go? You know, we wanted to do the first silent auction we did was at the Waldorf Astoria. I don't know if you remember that event, but I mm. said, you know, because my whole background um you know, had been in fundraising and event planning, you know, and nonprofit development. I said, listen, all these other organizations do, um, you know, uh, silent auctions, you know, and it's, it's just, it sort of found money, you know, I said, but let's, let's have our silent auction be very curated, like about Greece. So like the best Greek designers, the best things like from Greek Americans and from Greeks, you know, in arts and culture and sports, whatever it is. And so, you know, we have a volunteer named Tula Livanos who sort of runs with it every year. She gets us like fantastic artwork, fantastic thing. And then couple that with all of Artemis's or Artemis Kohas's contacts, you know, like in the restaurant world, in the spirits world, like all of that, you know, and we just have this out of control, like successful silent auction. This year, we took in 150,000 in our silent auction alone. Um, and, and now we're running a mid-year auction. So People that want to, and, and we curate the auction, you know, it can't just be, you know, hi, you know, my yaya has like a dirty food ton in her house and I'd like to like, you know, donate to your auction. We're like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. You know, like we, you know, we, we curate the auction. So, you know, we have like, 
jewelry from La Launas, you know, we have jewelry from Zolotas, you know, we have um, clothing from Zeus and Dion, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, handbags, you know, from Alexandra Kumba, you know, we have cufflinks from Alexandra Kumba. We like, we're trying to sort of showcase, you know, the best that exists in Greece and the best that exists in the Greek diaspora, you know, at our auction. And then, you know, we, and we want to have something in all price ranges as well. So, you know, we have hats, t-shirts that are branded THI. And we also do like our t-shirts are done with Kukuzi here in Athens, you know, who's like fantastic brand, you know, and Nikos who owns the store does an amazing job. And so, you know, we have THI's logo, you know, and on the back it says Kukuzi, you know, like with the Hellenic initiative. Um, Cause we want, you know, people, we, we also want people when they come to Greece to go find these stores, you know, and to go and to shop there. Um, so it's, it's part of our strategy is not just making money in the auction, but um, but helping these designers, you know, and artists um, and other people who are donating donating to us, like you know, sort of gain like marketing interest, you know, from Greeks in the diaspora. It's because we're obviously where their demographic. Right. So you said before THI, you were involved with philanthropic work basically throughout your life. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. would you, what advice would you give someone that is just starting out that wants to do, uh, be in philanthropy? Um, listen, I think it's, uh, like it's extremely rewarding field, you know, and, um, and part of philanthropy is, you know, science and part of it is art, you know? So, you know, if I would say, you know, if you're, um, if you're not a people person, I would suggest that, you know, like maybe you look at like, you know, another field. Um, but if you are a people person, you know, and you're organized, um, I think, you know, you're like being getting involved in philanthropy is just going to be, um, uh, you know, you could just build a lifetime career out of it, you know, that's going to be extremely rewarding. Um, I mean, it has been for me. I mean, I started in politics you know, which I loved. I was doing political fundraising for years. So I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked on, you know, two Senate races. And uh, and then I started raising money for congressional candidates, you know, and I just, I loved it. I loved traveling. I loved meeting people. I loved learning about like all sorts of work that people were doing. I liked learning about the issues, you know, so, okay, you know, this member of Congress is sitting on transportation. I'll say, okay, so like what companies or what individuals will care about transportation issues, you know? So I like that sort of the strategy behind all of that. And I think for somebody who's, who is strategic, you know, and, and also creative, you know, that a career in philanthropy can just, you know, be extremely rewarding. Um, and I think, you know, if you get involved, especially in the foundation world, you know, the, <clears throat> the money that you can make in the foundation world is also comparative, you know, to like what you'd make in the private sector. Um, and so that's also rewarding, you know, because you don't have to sort of sacrifice, you know, like having a nice life or providing for your family just because you want to, you know, do something good for the world. Sure. Um, awesome. What is one of your proudest moments over the last, over the last decade at THI? What is one of your proudest moments that stands out? That's a really good question. <clears throat> I, I have to say that I think our very first new leaders event that we did in New York um, down at, um, at the old um, customs house, uh, which is owned by the Pulakakos family, Peter Pulakakos, you know, like I sort of never, it, like that's the event where like the light bulb went off for me. You know, I thought like, oh my God, like, look at like all these like successful, like young professional Greeks, you know, that are at this event um, and um, just packed, you know, and all of them wanting like fresh faced, all of them wanting to get more involved, all of them wanting to know when the next event was, all of them wanting to know how they could help THI, wanting to, you know, get to volunteer with THI in Greece, you know, do all these things. And it was sort of a watershed moment for me, you know, I thought like, okay, this, like this is an important movement, you know, and like this event is important because it just sort of signifies that like we are on the map, even more so than like our first gala that I mentioned, you know, that raised all that money. Having like 200, and, I mean, we, we said we could only, we, you know, we wanted to cap that event at 100, you know, new leaders and we had like 225 new leaders to that event. And I thought that is, that's, that speaks volumes, you know, about, uh, like what we do and 
the other thing, one of the other things that I'm extremely proud of is our support of an organization called Metadrasi. Um, and Metadrasi acts um, as um, sort of the country's like de facto translation service for refugees. Um, but it also uh, cares for and looks out for unaccompanied minors in Greece. Um, and with support from THI, um, Metadrasi was able to renovate a neoclassical building you know, in Metellini that was used for unaccompanied minors. Um, and you can't imagine, you know, like, I mean, the, we're talking about sometimes kids who are like, you know, six years old, you know, who's, who have traveled to Greece on their own or whose parents died on the way, you know, or have dealt with like, I mean, horrible circumstances, you know, and, you know, and with our support, you know, Metathesi was able to sort of build a shelter, you know, that sort of gives these kids, you know, like sort of a safe, loving place, you know, to sort of start rebuilding their lives. Um, and we just heard the story of a young man, you know, who, you know, was at Metathesi and was at one of these shelters. And now he's actually studying at university in France, you know, and that's all a result of like, you know, of Metadrasi's work, you know, and THI being able to support it. There's been a lot of success stories, obviously through THI over the years. I but what I want to ask you is, what? How do you, as Peter Poulos, define success? Um, like me personally. Um, listen, I think you know that we all have to be kind to each other. You know, um, I um, and um, uh, and you know, if there's one thing that I've learned, you know, managing, you know, a, a staff of eleven people and a board of thirty-three people, you know, and all these other different organizations like around the country and people, you know, you know, doing, you know, trying doing different things, you know, that we have to always keep our eye on the prize, and the prize is helping Greece, you know, and so. You know, we may have a different, we may have a difference of opinion about things sometimes, you know, or not like, but like, we need to be kind to one another, you know, and we need to support one another, you know, and if I find that, um, um, you know, that someone that we're working with, you know, or somebody that we're collaborating with, you know, like, isn't being kind, you know, or isn't being supportive, you know, or doesn't sort of share that same sort of, you know, vision for like, you know, what we should be doing, you know, we, you um, um, you know, we just sort of po politely move away from that person or from that organization. And, and so I would, I would have to say that, you know, I think sort of understanding, you know, that, you know, that we need, that as a community, we all need to embrace each other would be the definition of like success to me, you know. Well said, I like that answer. Um, I want to ask, obviously, we got to talk a little bit of Greece before I let you go. Um, sure. Where, where's home in Greece for you? So I live right downtown. I live on uh, Metropolis Street, like right behind the cathedral. Um, and, you know, I wanted something very urban. When I first moved here, I moved here 15 years ago. When I first moved here, I lived in Kipseli. Um, and, uh, you know, many Greeks were like, Yati many xenos. So, um, so um, I really, like, I liked it. I liked the buildings. I liked the feel of it. I liked how multiculti it was. It sort of reminded me of New York, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, uh, but then I found, you know, a place in Plaka. I lived there for six years. And then I found this place in Metropolis in a 1930s building, because I really like Athenian Bauhaus, like interwar, like modernism buildings. And um, and so I moved here, like um, so now it's been seven years that I've been living here and I just, and I absolutely love it. Like I love being in the mix of all of it. I like being close to Sindagma. I love being close to the National Gardens and the Zapio, because that's where I walk my dog. You know, I like being close to Monasteraiki and Stiri. You know, I, I was like, I walk everywhere. I mean, I, I'm probably walking, you know, 20,000 steps a day around downtown Athens. Yeah. No, now that Ammonia, Ammonia's had like a real renaissance, you know, mm -hmm. like I find like when I go on my afternoon walks with my dog, we head that way towards Ammonia. Um, and that it's really nice to see, you know, like the city moving forward, like, you know, buildings getting fixed and you know, new hotels opening and stores opening and little one-off shops opening up. Like yeah. that's, to me, that's, uh, it's very vibrant. No, it definitely is. No, your location, your place is absolutely stunning. Um, 
How much time do you spend in Greece? Are you there full time now and you just come to the U.S. when you want to? Or is it a mix or what, what's going on with there? Well, if you were the IRS asking me, I would tell you that I spend six months a year here. But um, I'm spending probably a little bit more time here in Greece than I am in the U.S. now. But okay. I still spend a lot of time in the U.S. because I, um, you know, my whole my family's, you know, in uh, my mom and my cousins and aunts and uncles are all in New York, you know, um, my sister's in Connecticut, my brother's in Washington, D.C., you know, so THI's main office is in New York. And I, I like spending time, you know, in the patri in my patrida. Um, Definitely. But, um, I, you know, I prefer it here in Greece. I just do. It. I and I prefer it in Athens. Yeah. I love Thessaloniki, but I prefer it in Athens. I just love it here. Aside from Athens, Thessaloniki, Give me three places that you love visiting uh, in Greece. Islands, mainland, doesn't matter. Anywhere in Greece. Yeah. Uh, I love Thessaloniki. I think it's just this young, vibrant, like great city, fantastic architecture. Like I like the proximity to the water. I like the whole pasarela, you know, along the Limani, you know, and exercise, going, running there, or walking or riding a bike. I think it's just terrific. The food's out of control. I mean, I love Byzantine architecture. And so, you know, that is, you know, like, that is like, you know, ground zero for Byzantine architecture. I mean, it's just an amazing place. I like Kalamata a lot. Like I find myself like very attracted like to Kalamata and Messinia, just in general, Pilos and that like whole region, like really beautiful. Of course, Athens, you know, I mean, I have a house on Paros and so I spend a lot of time there. I've been, you know, I've been going to Paros since 1984, almost every summer since 1984. So I spent, you know, and I like, I just like the whole vibe of the island, like you do, you know, like yeah. I like the vibe of the place, you know, I like that, that there's a connection between people and the land on Paros. Like, you know, people, you go to a restaurant, people are like, oh, I made that cheese or those vegetables are from my garden or, you know, yeah. I caught those sardellas, you know, I mean, I love that, you know, yeah. um, and I love being able to go to a beach where there's no people and you can still do that on Paros. Um, sure. You know, I mean, I, I really like Falegandros a lot. Um, I think it's a super special place. I like Hanya in Crete. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to move here was like, I, I just wasn't satisfied with coming to visit Greece like three weeks a year, like for the rest yeah. of my life. I thought like, well, if I live here, I can go visit some new place like all the time. And that's what I do. So, you know, just get in the car with the dog and my partner, Mark, and we just go, you know, and, you know, we'll go to Nemea, you know, we'll go to, you know, we'll go to Kalambaka, we'll go, you know, wherever it is, you know, we're, we'll go to Parga, you know, like, yeah. okay, let's just go check out some new place in Greece, you know, that we haven't been. And we do that in Athens, too. I'm constantly exploring Athens, you know, like different right. neighborhoods in Athens. Like, I mean, I'd never been to Anopatisia, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to go, like, I'm going to take the Electrico, and I'm going to go walk around Anopatisia. And I was completely amazed, like, you just, it's so, it's incredibly vibrant here, you know, and I didn't, have that feeling when I lived in San Francisco, you know, San Francisco, you know, even though, you know, it's a beautiful city, you know, it felt like, you know, it, it felt almost lonely, you know, and after, you know, eight o'clock at night, forget it, the sidewalks roll up, you know, and here, I mean, you know, I can take my dog for a walk at midnight and it's packed outside, even yeah. on a weekday. There's yeah. something, I was telling Diane Kokilas, there's something very life affirming about a traffic jam at 6 a.m. and it's not people going to work people going home from the clubs <laughs> yeah speaking of diane have you been to ikaria yet i have never been to ikaria and that's real it's like top of my list and um and it's really weird because i grew up in a little town on long island called patchog you know that has like more icarians than than ikaria itself you know um and um uh so i'm waiting for uh, an invitation from diane so i can go visit ikaria this summer you yeah. know Right. She's actually invited me. I just haven't got it. There, I just said go. that to annoy <laughs> Yeah, when we were there in, uh, this past summer, a group of us went to Caria, and on the last night we had dinner with her. So it was pretty cool. It was a good it's time. It's a great place, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, the island was amazing. Amazing. Yeah. But uh, that's also what inspired me. I love what you said in the beginning about, is it really, we can only come here two, three weeks and that's it? Like when, when I saw that a couple of years in a row, I'm like, this, that doesn't work for me. I want to be here more. So I got to find a way to have to be here more. And that's our mind. How much time did you spend here last year? Four months. Yeah, you were here a long time. Yeah, four months. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't spend that much more time here than you did. 
you know. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. I, I no, want to get back in the winter again. The last time I came in the winter was 2020, right before COVID. The year we did New Year's at your place. That was the last yeah. time I, um, I, I wanted to come this year, but a lot happened over the, the, the holidays and we just couldn't leave. But we'll be there in June uh, with a slight chance for Pascha, but we definitely be there by June. And then hopefully next winter we'll, we'll get to see winter again. But I also love the shout out for Kalamata because that's where my dad's side of the family is from. Where's your mom from? Uh, Kalimnos. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been to Kalimnos. I love Kalimnos. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. What a great Lots place. Lots of sponges there. So Kalamata yeah. is like, Kalamata feels like, you know, these Greek cities, you know, that are small, like Kalamata's population is like 100,000, you know, but like. Go to a city in America with 100,000 people, you know, it's like dead. You go to yeah, Kalamata, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's, is, is everyone out of yeah. their house right now? I mean, yeah, what's yeah. going the on? The platea is like, always full. It's always full. <laughs> the platea is always full. The restaurants are always full. Yeah. People are, I love all the bike lanes. People are running around the world. The architecture is great, you know, and you can basically go swimming for almost all the year there. Yeah, you know, they have the warmest water. It's insane. Every time I go there, I'm always like, why is it always so much warmer here? But I get it a lot further south. Um, speaking of Greece, I don't know if this is something in the visions or it, or if it already has happened. Is there a THI in Greece or no? Listen, we, it seems like more and more of our staff is moving here, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, our goal was to like, was to engage Greeks in the diaspora to help Greece. It wasn't to like fundraise from Greeks in Greece. We thought Greeks in Greece are doing enough on their own. And it's true. Right. So we don't actively fundraise from Greeks in Greece. We don't okay. want to. We're okay. not going to. But just we get a lot of contributions from Greeks in Greece. Um, you know, we and obviously we don't turn away anybody's contribution. But you know, like when we when we do a campaign, we just have a lot of Greeks in Greece who are following us on social media. Lots. Especially, you know, like people like me and you, you know, who had like one foot, like in another country, you know, and came here or something like that. So we, we get a tremendous amount of support from Greeks in Greece, um, but we, we are not actively fundraising from Greeks in Greece. However, we will do a new leaders event here um, this summer um, because we, you know, we, we, we always do an American style venture fair. This was also George Stamos's idea. It's been wildly successful. So and it's basically it's a it's an American style pitching event, you know, for companies, you know, we we sort of THI acts like the, you know, the nonprofit matchmaker. So we, you know, we vet all the teams, we get all the teams venture fair ready, you know, with a, you know, with an American, you know, like a VC consultant. And then, you know, we invite all the investors, we pay for everything, you know, and we put everyone in the same room and hope that the magic happens, you know, that that the companies like find investment dollars, you know, capital. Mm. Um, it's been wildly successful. We haven't been able to do it, you know, for two years. So, but we are going to do it again this year. And we thought, let's, let, you know, because so many Greek Americans, Greek Canadians, Greek Australians, Greek something else is, they're here in Athens during the summer. We thought, okay, well, let's just do a new leaders event here. So we're going to do it. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Just a couple more. Um, my A lot of my listeners always love this question because they, they just, Want to know what everyone's eating? What? Give me your three favorite Greek dishes. My okay, thrapsolo, like grilled thrapsolo, yeah. sardellas. Okay, and then number one on my list is tarmosalata. Like I okay. could eat tarmosalata all day long, Love all it. day long. Just eat yeah. it plain. Mm -hmm. I like tarmosalata that's uh, that's uh, made with potato too, not with bread. Speaking of sardellas, uh, one of my girlfriend's favorite dishes, and we were eating in Pirea uh, at the beginning of our trip, and this this uh, seagull was watching us eat and just kept its mouth open, waiting for us to like feed it. She gets up to take a walk for a second. It jumps on our table and just goes at her sardellas. <laughs> and then <laughs> it was hysterical. Just like <laughs> annihilated our table. <laughs> it was like, if Be you're careful, not going to feed me, I'm destroying your table. <laughs> i think i know i might know that seagull actually so i, mean, I think, I've, I think um, I've met that seagull before. yeah exactly three favorite desserts okay um my three favorite desserts um i'm um 
I, I really like halvas, you know, if it is um, like served with ice cream. And if it, there's a place right up the street here, Zizigas no Mermigas, they, they make a halvas. It doesn't even, I don't even know. It doesn't even taste like halvas. I don't know what it is. It's like a deconstructed halvas. It's not like, it's not super solid. It's like soft. Um, and they serve it with like, you know, like ekmek, you know, like that. I mean, it's just it's incredible. Um, I like that dessert. Um, I love uh, melomakarna. Um, I could eat that like all day long. Um, and uh, I love tomato spoon sweet. Nice. And one, the one place on the top of your bucket list in Greece to visit. Yes. Um, let's see. Well, I just said Ikaria. Yeah. So we'll leave um, that one out aside from Ikaria. I'm going to leave that one out. I'm going to say Nisiros. Okay. Good choice. I really want to visit. I really want to visit Nisiros this year. No, I'm sorry. I'm taking that back. I want to go to Astipalia. I want to go to Astipalia for the first time. I've never been to Astipalia. Okay. Yeah, I almost went last year. It didn't happen, but maybe the summer. I hear good things. Yeah. Um, if you can be remembered for one thing, running THI as executive director so far, what would that one thing be? Um, God, that's a great question. Um, I'd like to be, um, you know, remembered as a good leader. Um, and I hope I was a good mentor to a lot of the people who are on our staff. Um, and I think I was, you know, to be remembered as somebody who was fair and honest and a good leader. That's how I'd like to be remembered at THI. Perfect. And what inspires your work ethic every day? That's such a great question. And it's so fitting and timely right now because uh, I've been thinking about my, um, my, my father died eight years ago yesterday and his brother Nick died uh, three years ago today. Um, and you know they had this incredible relationship and I've never seen two people who worked so hard in my whole life. I mean, they had like, they, they were so singularly focused, you know, on like doing a good job. You know, my father was a pharmacist, no drugstores. My uncle was an engineer and worked for Harris Corporation. But like whatever they did, they like sort of put their heart and soul into it, you know? And they did it with so much like sevasmo, you know, and like, and pride, you know? And, um, and you know, I started, you know, working at one of my father's stores like when I was about eight years old. I mean, we're like, my family was breaking like every child labor law, you know, that existed. But, you know, my brother and, Mr. and I were like all forced to work at the store. But I just got to see, you know, how my father was. I mean, he never took a sick day. You know, he, the store was always open, you know, like somebody would call in the middle of the night and like it needed a, you know, a, like a prescription and like, you know, he would get up and go open up the store. It could be three in the morning or four in the morning, like, and, you know, and how, you know, we used to have to deliver prescriptions, you know, to like people all over town, you know, and like, and, you know, my father was like, you need to sit with them, you know, and you need to talk to them because sometimes, you know, you might be the only person all week long, you know, who are they're sitting and talking to, you know, so you need to like engage with them. You know, and those were just like such important life lessons, you know, at a really early age, you know, and that is, I, I feel like, you know, that I've taken that with me my whole life, you know, and so, you know, I try not to bother like members of the staff on the weekends, you know, because I want people to like have a weekend and all that stuff. But I, you know, I, I'm, I've always been like very self-motivated and I want to surround myself by people who are self-motivated. Every single member of THI's team is self-motivated. Like you don't have to sort of follow up on anyone. They just get their job done. And that's just, that's such a pleasure, you know, to like have, like to work with a team like that, you know, and because, I, and I realized like they probably saw exactly what I saw from like my parents. You know, I mean, my mother was the same way, you know, just driven, like committed people. I think we're lucky as Greeks, you know, like to have like to have those examples. I think so many of us in our families, I'm sure you do, too, just have those like those examples of like this incredible work ethic, you know. Um, so I'm really I'm really thankful for it. I just need to learn when to turn it off. So I'm learning that now in my you know, as I get older, um, you know, 
time, you know, is becoming more precious for me, you know, and I, you know, I definitely want to take more time, you know, for myself and just to be thoughtful and sit, spend more time with my family and that kind of thing. Sure. Amazing. Last question before I let you go. Um, what does being Greek mean to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I've often thought like, you know, if, um, like, if, you know, like one day far from now, you know, like when I die and go to heaven, if God asks me, he said, you have a choice, like, you know, what would you like, you know, you could come back to on earth as any nationality, what would you like to come back as? And I'd say, well, I want to be Greek, you know, I mean, it is my whole life, you know, it is like, it is what defines like me as a person, you know, I, um, I love meeting other Greeks, you know, I love helping other Greeks. I love living in Greece, you know. I love that like, you know, you and I meet the first time, you know, and we have an immediate connection because we're Greek. I think we're so fortunate, you know. I don't I don't think there aren't many ethnic groups like that in the world. I can't, you know, like and I hear from my Jewish friends or my Italian friends and they're like, "We're not like you Greeks." Yeah. Like we've never seen anything like that. And so you know, I think we're we're part of this very, you know, like special, like, you know, like our DNA, our blood, we're part of these very special group of like, you know, like people on this earth, you know, like there's not that many of us, you know, but like we are we are all a family and like a great community. I mean, Artemis Kohas was saying, you know, after we had our, you know, sort of our kickoff event for the new leaders before the gala in New York, our little the annual cocktail party they ever do. She called me afterwards and said, how did it go? She said, I just love our community. She said, I, I love our community. I love being a part of the community. And I, I feel that way as well. Like that's what being Greek is to me, you know, that we're just part of like one big giant, like loving family. Amazing. Peter, this has been fun. Uh, great this chatting great, with you Tony. today. Um, really quickly, how can people find THI and yourself if they want to look into maybe helping THI, donate to THI, sure. maybe, well, the website, where, whether it's the US or around the world. Sure. I mean, you can find everything about the organization on our website, www.thehellenicinitiative.org, or you can follow us on Instagram, you know, um, or on LinkedIn, you know, or on Twitter, uh, the Hellenic Initiative. You'll also see the Hellenic Initiative of Australia, the Hellenic Initiative of Canada. I encourage people to follow those, you know, like to to, to follow those as well, you know, to friend them on Facebook, you know, or to follow them on Instagram, because they're doing like wonderful, great, vibrant things as well. Um, me personally, you can find uh, my Instagram handle is Mr. Peter and Mr. Stavros. Stavros is my dog. So, and, you know, and you'll see in my, you know, on my Instagram feed, like lots of things about architecture in Athens and stuff that's going on. If you care about those things, you know, um, you can read those. And on my Facebook page, just my name, Peter Poulos, you're just going to see a picture of my dog, me and my dog there. So, um, you know, it's easy to sort of find me. Um, but yeah, no, we're, um, our community is really growing on the Hellenic Initiative. I think we, and we post a lot. So we're constantly doing updates. Um, so it's almost every day we're updating on Instagram and Facebook. That's amazing. Well, thank you, Peter, and uh, see you soon, you, when, uh, whether it's here in the U.S. or in Greece uh, later this spring or summer. I'll, I'm going to be in Boston at the end of the month, so we're coming to see you. Perfect. Then I'll see you in Boston. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This has been Peter Poulos from the Hellenic Initiative, and we'll talk to you again on the next episode.